today we're going to talk about the 11 types of alopecia. Now, what does the word alopecia mean? It comes from a Greek word, uh, alopex, which means fox. And the reason why they talk about a fox is that certain fox get uh, an infection with mites and they start losing their hair in different patches. So that's the origin of the word alopecia. Now, as I go through this, there's a lot of new words uh, that you may not be familiar with. Just realize they're mostly Greek or Latin words that describe the characteristics of what's happening with your hair. So definitely don't get caught up with the names, just classifications of different types of hair loss. Now, some of these conditions that I'm gonna talk about um, are not really a hair loss problem. That's a symptom. The underlying real problem is the immune system. And so when someone has an autoimmune condition, they develop antibodies against their own tissues. In certain types of alopecia, you have the body developing antibodies to your own hair follicles, and that creates a loss of hair or some type of thinning with the hair or damage with the hair root, or the hair just doesn't grow. Other types of alopecia could have a genetic component, but don't get too caught up in the genetics because there's something called epigenetics, which is above your genes. And so you can do things about this, even though you have a genetic problem. And then there's a type of alopecia that is caused by too much DHT, which is a very powerful form of testosterone. So I'm definitely gonna get into the remedies uh, after I describe each type. So let's start with number one, alopecia areata. Okay, now what does the word areata mean? comes from the Latin word, which means area, as in a vacant space or patch, okay? So this is where you see patches of hair loss throughout your hair because of a certain autoimmune disease. Now, there are certain types of alopecia areata that I'm gonna describe right now. And this is gonna include different patterns of hair loss, uh, hair loss to your eyebrows, hair loss to different parts of your body, but with this condition, there's usually a problem with your T cells. That's part of the immune system. Your body has some type of confusion and it's attacking the wrong thing, our own hair. And so this general type of alopecia areata can then get worse and become alopecia areatus totalis, which means that you have this total hair loss in the top of your head, which I will get into in a minute, or alopecia areata universalis, which is hair loss throughout the entire body and the rest of the hair in your body, including your pubic hair and axillary hair, the hair underneath your armpits. And then the next type of alopecia is called diffuse alopecia areata and sometimes referred as incognita. And don't ask me why they use these incredibly long names, maybe to make them sound very, very scientific. So in this diffuse type, instead of having patches of hair loss, you have areas that are very, very thin. So the hair follicle is very, very thin, and it looks like there's some patches. Then we have the next type called alopecia areata ophiasis. Try to say that three times. In this type, you have hair loss on the sides of the head, as well as in the lower back part of your skull. This type is uh, really difficult to treat with medications. So I would go with natural recommendations, which I'm going to get to. Okay, so the next one is called alopecia barbe. This one is a loss of hair either on your mustache or your beard. So this version could also um, occur with other types of hair loss as well, but it's very specific to the beard and mustache area. All right, the next one is called androgenic alopecia. Another name for this would be pattern hair loss. Now, normally hair grows in these little groups between three and four hairs. And so with this condition, you're gonna see those little patches of hair or little groups of hair start shrinking or atrophying. And so the number of hairs in these little groups are gonna get less and less and less. And eventually when they're gone, you're gonna see more scalp than you see hair. And so androgenic alopecia is commonly known as male pattern hair loss, but you also have women pattern hair loss too. And this is the most common cause of hair loss in fact, 50% of men over the age of 50 have this condition, and 50% of women over the age of 65 start developing this condition. And so on a man, you'll see receding hair loss right up to here, and then a loss of hair on the top part of the head. And with women, you'll see more just 
spinning on the top part of the head. All right, this next one has a very long name. So we're just gonna call it CCCA, okay? Just to make it really simple. So this type involves scarring on the top of your head. This is most common in women that have an African descent. And adding some vitamin E oil, in fact, massaging that into the scalp can be a great thing to help break down some of the scar tissue and also provide more oxygen stimulation to the scalp. But the problem is if it's there too long, the scar tissue um, could get to the point where it's, it's permanent, it's irreversible. All right, the next one is called frontal fibrosing alopecia. This one involves the sideburns and the frontal part of your head. This mostly involves uh, menopausal females, but it can also affect men as well. So with this, you're gonna see a lot of receding of the hair through here due to scar tissue. Some people may lose their eyebrows or eyelashes with this condition. All right, the next one is called traction alopecia. And this occurs because there's strain or stress on the hair roots. It usually occurs when people have these uh, very tight hairstyles. So you have people who are using braids, dreadlocks, or a ponytail, or even using certain chemical relaxers that can weaken the hair. So this constant traction actually pulls the hair right out of the scalp. And the last one is called chemotherapy-induced alopecia. Unfortunately, the chemicals that use in cancer therapy uh, destroy not just the immune system, they can destroy uh, different parts of your body, including the roots of your hair. But as soon as the chemotherapy is um, stopped, the hair should come back given the right nutrition the person's on and the overall health of the immune system. Now, I do want to say one thing about uh, chemotherapy. Anytime someone goes through chemotherapy, it's very, very important for them to also do intermittent fasting and periodic prolonged fasting. The fasting can greatly reduce the side effects from chemotherapy as well as radiation therapy. All right, so at this point, let's talk about some really good remedies that I would recommend if you have any of these type of alopecia issues. Number one, rosemary oil is a really great um, natural oil to rub into your scalp uh, each night before you go to bed. There's certain properties in rosemary oil that are great for many different types of alopecia issues. And as a side note, castor oil is good for the loss of your eyebrows. Now, there's a lot of things you can also use, like onion juice and garlic oil and green tea. Of course, don't put it on your scalp hot, but wait till it cools down and you can rub it into your scalp. But there's many different herbal extracts that can help stimulate the growth of hair. But in this list, there are seven things I'm gonna talk about. One is the rosemary oil, okay? Number two is taking a really good probiotic. Why? Because in many autoimmune conditions, it starts in your gut. Your gut becomes too permeable. It's called leaky gut. And you have the entire immune system right behind the barrier. And certain things get in there and you start creating um, all sorts of issues with immune-wise. So a probiotic is very important, especially if you have a history of gut problems that occurred just before you start developing this hair issue. I always recommend to get a clue on what's causing your hair loss is just to look back in time and find out what occurred just before you started to develop this condition. And it could be any condition at all, any body problem. There's always something right before this that triggered it. It could be a severe stress, like a loss of a loved one, which by the way, is behind a lot of autoimmune diseases. So this gives you information to help you um, try to undo some of the damage based on what caused it. If it was a stress trigger, then you can work on doing all sorts of things to improve stress, both food-wise, environmentally, and certain supplements. All right, number three, zinc. Zinc is essential if you have any immune issues at all. Number four, vitamin D. Vitamin D and zinc for any immune problems is very, very important. Vitamin D is an immune modulator. It is the best remedy for any autoimmune condition. I've done a lot of videos on this, and I would recommend taking nothing less than 10,000 IUs, but probably 20 or 30,000 IUs of vitamin D every single day. All right, the next one is using an infrared type treatment on your scalp. There's a lot of new devices coming out that are like little helmets that you put over your head. The infrared spectrum of light energy uh, is really good 
to help reduce androgenic type problems with the hair. Because what's happening is we have this enzyme that's converting more free testosterone to DHT, which is a very powerful form of testosterone, and that's burning the hair out. And so anything that you can do to interfere with that uh, process is a good thing. And there's a lot of herbal things you can take too, like salt palmetto, stinging nettle root. But the infrared um, light on your scalp uh, has been shown to create some significant improvement in your hair. All right, so the next one, and we fasting. You need to be doing intermittent fasting, okay? And definitely periodic prolonged fasting. Fasting for autoimmune conditions, to drop inflammation, uh, for any genetic problems or weaknesses is dynamite as far as the effectiveness in helping you put this thing back in remission because we can never say cure. We'll just say put it back in remission. Fasting is probably one of the most powerful epigenetic things you can do, especially if you have a genetic predisposition to any condition. All right, and the last thing is reducing your stress. I've already mentioned that, but there are many, many things you can do to pull yourself out of this stress state. And I'm talking about a chronic stress situation where you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. It could be either environmental, where you're in an environment where there's a lot of stress, or you had a severe loss. There are many things you can do. In fact, I want to put up probably one of the most important videos I've done on stress right here. So check that out.